sir. Okay, um, this is a big topic, uh, one that I, I kind of thought would be kind of interesting for folks um, because mainly it's about timing. Uh, as with all things with Bitcoin in particular, uh, a lot of this is about timing. So uh, I called this one before the halving, uh, which sounds kind of like something from Game of Thrones, um, but it's actually a very important thing in the Bitcoin uh, community. Um, I'm going to kind of come on to that in a bit. There are kind of three uh, major events uh, that are going on in the uh, Bitcoin world in particular um, that even I get. So, so I'm going to introduce Finn in a second. Finn is our group CEO. Very rare that I actually get somebody from our own company to do a talk here, but Finn's uh, bananas about crypto and has been since it was all launched. Um, and I was always the kind of classic, okay, it sounds interesting but it sounds really risky too. And he's like, yeah, don't worry about it. Go, go now. And I should have gone now when he said, but in January, one major piece of news happened, which was that in America, the SEC uh, regulated and helped therefore launch, uh, or gave approval for the launch of 11 uh, ETFs, they're called, exchange traded funds. And uh, this has been an ongoing saga in the crypto world, is it an asset? Is it should it be even securitized and and therefore regulated? How do you do that? Let's not get into that. The news is it happened. Okay, and I want to show you something. You probably can't see it from back in the back, but basically, <clears throat> this is a, a, a Bitcoin ETF tracker on Blockworks, and you can see here um, the the top ones. Uh, Grayscale was a futures uh, Bitcoin futures uh, trust, I believe. And then that has now been, they're trying to move it into a straight up uh, Bitcoin ETF, but not really working. The main two are BlackRock and Fidelity. These are household names, okay? In America, anyway, they're household names. So, you know, people in America in particular, but here as well, do a lot of investing in things like shares and all sorts, uh, right? Uh, commodities and uh, bonds and stuff like that. So I know loads of people, uh, like, um, you know, families in America sort of thing, they just would always just invest in stocks and shares and have done for a long, long time. And actually, um, the chief of BlackRock, a guy named uh, Larry Fink, has just released this week. If you're interested, go read it. Highly recommend you do. His annual letter to shareholders and other people. And he talks about everything that's right and everything that's wrong with the U.S. economy and the global economy and what we need to do to talk about it and change it. BlackRock is, therefore, a very much a household name as is Fidelity. So Fidelity has been around since I think early 80s, late 70s in America. These two institutions have basically helped revolutionize or popularize sort of modern, easy, efficient investing in America. And they also operate over here in the UK. So this ETF tracker here, I know Finn's gonna talk a little bit about it. The only thing I wanted to say is that basically since January, these two funds alone, BlackRock and Fidelity, don't even worry about the, the other sort of, uh, there's 11, so it must be nine. Um, since I think I took this today, um, they have assets, it says AUM there, that's assets under management. Just since January alone, they've got between them 26, 27 billion dollars under management, just those two. So to me, <clears throat> this is a bit of a watershed moment, and you'll hear a lot of people in the, in the sort of Bitcoin market talk about why is this a big deal. This is a big deal because now, if my mother-in-law lived in America, okay, my mom, uh, my mom lives in America, she can right now go, hi, or just get on, uh, online, and just go, oh, I think I'll just put $100 into that ETF that's now kind of almost directly investing in Bitcoin. That's transformative, and it's beginning of uh, Bitcoin and other cryptos becoming massively accessible and popular. So that's point one. Point two that I wanted to mention is two weeks ago, the entire Bitcoin market uh, got past that of the silver market, right? So that's interesting to me. 
right? So you've got commodities here like gold worth about 14 to 15 trillion dollars, right? Silver is like like less than must be about 1.2 trillion dollars global worth and Bitcoin surpassed it just in terms of its valuation. That's when it went so Bitcoin did its all-time highs the other day, about 70,000, just dabbling, it's sort of hovering around 69 at the minute, 1,000 US dollars per Bitcoin at the minute. And, and that global market cap of Bitcoin has now gone past silver. I think that was another major thing. If people look back on this, they'll be like, ooh, okay, Q1, 2024, that is when Bitcoin just started to do whoosh like this. And then finally, the halving itself. I won't go into it too much, other than just to say, that basically, if you don't understand anything about Bitcoin, understand this. It is a finite supply. Forget about what it is, because <laughs> you can talk about that forever and ever, but let's just assume that it's a cryptocurrency, whatever the heck that means. But basically, it's a finite supply, and that it is pretty much a, a, a sort of a provable finite supply. And that means that basically, uh, it'll, there'll never be more than what they said initially there was going to be. And they said initially that there'd be 21 million coins, okay? And <clears throat> so 21 million Bitcoin were going to be produced. And in 2009, 2012, 2016, 2020, and 2024, we get these four-year cycles. It's not technically every four years. It's every 210,000 blocks or yep. something like that. But roughly comes out to about every four years there is a almost a, de a requirement, a deflationary requirement to cut in half the amount of Bitcoin that is allowed to be then made available, right? Is that fair to say? Mm. I'll cover it. You cover it. I'll cover, I'll cover it, yeah. Just it's, remind it, me to talk about the deflationary inflationary. Because sure, sure. It's, yeah, it's designed to be deflationary. It's not actually, but it, it, yes. It is inflationary yeah, now. Yeah. It will become yeah. deflationary. Yeah. The point on this is that that finite supply, and I'll let Finn go into it in, in, in much better detail, but that finite supply, every four years, the supply of it gets cut in half. So it becomes scarcer. It becomes even more scarce than it was before the halving event. And we're coming up to one now. And the other thing is that if you look at the, the price of Bitcoin, and just to be, I should have said this at the beginning, we're not offering any investment advice. Uh, if you are interested <laughs> in investment advice, go seek it somewhere else from professionals. Uh, we're here to educate and inform, and that's it. Uh, we're not giving you any investment advice. But if you were to look at the um, trajectory of Bitcoin's price, you would see every four years, there's usually a massive sort of bull run of the, of the rise in price of Bitcoin that follows a halving event. And that's absolutely critical to understand what's going to happen or may happen uh, with Bitcoin uh, in the next 18 to 24 months.